China, 3rd century BC, a story is told of a merchant trying to sell a spear and a shield. When a customer asks how good his spear is, the merchant tells him that his spear can pierce any shield. The customer then asks how good the merchant's shield is, and he responds that it can defend from all spear attacks. The customer then asks one final question. What would happen if he were to take the merchant's spear and strike the shield? The merchant had no answer. This story originated the Chinese word for contradiction, Ma Duin, literally translated spear shield. So what does happen when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? Let's find out. Internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show where brains always defeat brawn. The show where sometimes maybe brains can in theory be preferable to strength? You know one of the biggest challenges with entertainment? It constantly has to one-up itself in order to stay new, fresh, and exciting. The first time The Matrix showed the world bullet time, no one had ever seen anything like it! But nowadays, it's all old hat. That first big team-up in The Avengers? Iconic cinema! But then Marvel couldn't just do it again, it already had been done. It had to evolve to stay fresh. So they did more heroes and they had them fight each other. And then again in Infinity War, they one up themselves yet again by mixing the powers in really cool ways. We can't just watch people in capes kick and punch each other anymore. The standard has been raised for audiences time and time again. The reason I bring this up is because escalation is hard. At a certain point, you hit a ceiling, and it's really hard to go backwards. If the fate of the world is on the line for a given movie, well, it's hard to go back to stories where the fate of the city is on the line. And after the fate of the world, where do you go? The fate of the galaxy? See? Then you're just, eh kind of stuck. Quite honestly, the same holds true for superheroes and their powers. Superman's biggest weakness as a character? It isn't kryptonite, it's that he's too strong. So today I wanted to pit two of superhero fiction's most escalated creations against each other to see which one comes out on top, the immovable object or the unstoppable force. In our first corner at 5'9", weighing 154 pounds, we have the guy whose greatest curse is that he wins every fight with a single punch. A character whose very existence is meant to parody overpowered anime superheroes, and the guy who shows us just how important it is to never skip leg day. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm of course talking about a baldy who is far from basic, One Punch Man, Saitama! How strong is Saitama? Insanely strong. Mechanical beings, mutated warriors, monsters, walls, buildings, swords, meteors. With a single punch, Saitama is able to bring each and every one down. His only weakness is boredom. In the second corner, it's our immovable object, the strongest material in all the Marvel filmiverse, the alien metal behind Captain America's impenetrable shield and Black Panther suit, able to protect our favorite heroes from being diced, shot, or dismembered, but watch out for those snaps. It's the most indestructible metal that Marvel has the rights to put up on screen, Vibranium! KSI and Logan Paul eat your hearts out. This is the biggest fight on YouTube, and I'm not even gonna make you pay 10 bucks for it. So, let's get ready to theorize! To figure out who wins the battle between Vibranium's defensive abilities and Saitama's offensive power, we first need to figure out just how strong each one truly is. So let's start with Vibranium. What makes this intergalactic metal so perfect for a match like this isn't how strong or durable it is, but because it has the ability to absorb kinetic energy. For those of you unfamiliar, in physics, kinetic energy is basically movement energy. All moving things have kinetic energy, which means that when Saitama goes to punch it, the Vibranium should be able to absorb most, if not all all of the force of Saitama's punch, storing that impact within the bonds of the material. Calculating the kinetic energy of an object is pretty easy. All it is is one half mass times velocity squared. So is it possible to measure the limits of how much kinetic energy a given amount of vibranium can handle? Well, we see multiple examples throughout the Marvel film verse of vibranium's durability. In Captain America the Winter Soldier, Captain America uses his vibranium shield to easily deflect bullets. In Black Panther, we see vibranium deflect multiple machine gun bullets. It reflects energy blasts from Iron Man and Civil War and can cushion falls. But, without question, the greatest feat of vibranium strength we see in the movies happens in the Avengers, when Captain America uses his shield to repel Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. 
which is some serious power because as stated in Thor, Yolnir forged in the heart of Earth. Dying star. And star matter is massive. According to Neil deGrasse Tyson on Twitter, quote, <clears throat> uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, mm, I don't know how he sounds. If Thor's hammer is made of neutron star matter, as implied by legend, then it weighs as much as a herd of 300 billion elephants. That's clearly Neil deGrasse Tyson. Nailed it! Now, I can already hear the angry internet commenters typing furiously that Odin said Thor's hammer was forged in a dying star, not from a dying star. And yeah, in the comics, Thor's hammer isn't constructed from star matter, but instead out of an enchanted metal called Uru. However, in the Marvel film verse, it all might just be one and the same. You see, this is how Thor describes the material his hammer is made out of in Thor Ragnarok. It was made from this the special metal from the heart of a dying star. It was made from this special metal from the heart of a star. And then again, in Avengers Infinity War, we see the construction of Thor's replacement hammer axe, Stormbreaker. And it seems like the heat of the star is used more to heat this mystery metal rather than fill the mold. How do we make it? Waken the heart of a dying star. We even know what type of star it is. If it is Forge, harnesses the blazing power of the neutron star. Long story short, at best, Uru and neutron star material in the movies are one and the same. And at worst, the Marvel universe just can't keep it all straight. Regardless, per National Geographic, a single sugar cube of a neutron star has a mass of 100 million tons. So even if Thor's hammer isn't made of star material, well, it's still gonna give us one massive estimate for how much kinetic energy that hammer generates and how much vibranium can actually withstand. So the mass of an object is equal to its density times its volume. The density of a neutron star is, on average, approximately 10 to the 17th kilograms per cubic meter. And per the one-to-one -one Marvel licensed replica, the dimensions of Thor's hammer are eight and a half inches in height, five and a half inches in width, and five and a half inches in length, which makes the volume of the hammer to be 257.125 cubic inches, or 0 0.00421352383131 cubic meters. Which means that the mass of Thor's hammer is equal to 10 to the 17th times 0.004 all that mess, or 421 trillion, 352 billion, 383 million, 100,000 kilograms, or if you're in America, 928 trillion, 922 billion, 995 million, 552,151 pounds. Holy Odin, that is a ton of weight. It's actually a lot more than a ton of weight. That is 71,000 times the weight of the Great Pyramid at Giza. Eight thousand times the weight of the entire Great Wall of China, which is assumed to be the heaviest man-made structure in the world at 116 billion pounds. But we can't actually confirm that since, you know, can't really pick up the thing and throw it onto a scale. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, that Thor can wield his hammer at least as fast as an ace pitcher, 100 miles per hour or 45 meters per second. That would mean that the energy required to deflect Thor's hammer is 426 quadrillion, 619 trillion, 287 billion, 888 million, 750 thousand joules. To put that into context, that is more than twice as much energy as the largest nuclear weapon ever tested on planet Earth. Nothing ever devised on planet Earth could ever take vibranium down. But then, what about something that was devised in anime? One Punch Man has done a lot of training for this fight. 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, and 100 squats. <laughs> Then a 10 kilometer run! And while that training regime might not sound like a lot, which is kind of the joke, guys, Saitama seems to possess a seemingly limitless amount of physical strength. Unlike vibranium, the mass of Saitama is a fairly standard 70 kilograms. So when it comes to kinetic energy, it's not his weight that's doing the damage, it's his speed. You see, all those squats and 10k runs over the last three years have given him a velocity that is off the charts. When Saitama fights the alien invader Lord Boros, he gets knocked to the moon. This is no big deal, because Saitama easily jumps from the moon right back to Earth in less than 19 seconds. The distance from the Earth to the moon is on average 238,606 miles or 384,000 kilometers, which means to travel from the moon to the Earth in 19 seconds or less, Saitama's average velocity per second would have had to have been 20,210,500 meters per second or 12,558,222 miles per second. That is 67 times the speed of light, which means that when it comes
comes to kinetic energy, Saitama is exerting at least one half times 70 kilograms times 20 million 210,500 squared, 142 quadrillion 962 trillion 508 billion 587 million 500,000 joules of kinetic energy, or about a third of what vibranium withstood when hit with Thor's hammer. So at the outset, it would seem that vibranium actually trumps One Punch Man. It's about three times stronger than the fastest we see him go in the anime. But it's important to remember that Saitama is lazy. He almost never uses his full strength in battle. And even though the moon jump is the fastest that we see him move, it's not his greatest feat of strength. For that, we need to examine when he punches through a planet-killing meteor on its way to Earth. In episode 7, we see Saitama stop a meteor that's described as a level 9 on the Torino scale. Now, that might seem like it's something that's just made up for the anime, but it's not. The Torino scale is a real method of categorizing the impact hazard of space objects, based on 1, their probability of hitting Earth, and 2, the kinetic energy and diameter of the asteroid. And it gives me great happiness to report that currently there are no space objects rated non-zero on the Torino scale. It would appear that Earth is safe. But a level 9 meteor is serious business. To give you some context, a level 10 is like the impact that killed off the dinosaurs and sent Earth into an ice age. Level 9 impacts, which do severe regional damage, happen once every 10,000 to 100,000 years. And knowing it's a level 9 tells us that the diameter of this asteroid is between 100 meters and 1 kilometer. So to approximate the mass of this anime's killer asteroid, I compared it to 101955 Bennu, an actual planet-killing asteroid floating around in space right now that fits right into the size range. As such, we can say that One Punch Man's asteroid has a rough mass of 78 billion kilograms, or 171,960,564,504 pounds. The weight of 10,000 Eiffel Towers. Meteors tend to enter Earth's atmosphere at speeds between 20 and 72 kilometers a second, so if Saitama's asteroid is traveling at the max speed of 72 kilometers a second, this would mean that the kinetic energy needed to at the very least stop this asteroid is... When I have to 202 quintillion 176 quadrillion joules. That is 473 times what we calculated for vibranium. Which means that in the battle between Saitama and vibranium, One Punch Man surges ahead. Something that he would be, well, he wouldn't really care about all that much. And remember, all of this is Saitama without even breaking a sweat. Vibranium, on the other hand, has shown some cracks in its literal armor. In Avengers Age of Ultron, Thor wasn't the only one having strange visions. It's easy to forget Tony Stark's hallucination where he saw Captain America's shield broken and all the Avengers dead amongst the rubble. And while yeah, that was just a mind trick brought about by the Scarlet Witch, it could be a sign of things to come in Avengers 4. I mean, in the comics, a number of people, both good and bad, have shown themselves able to destroy Captain America's shield, including the man that's currently on everyone's mind, Thanos. In the comics, Infinity War is based on, after that infamous snap, Earth's surviving heroes launch a final desperate attack against Mad Dad Thanos, still equipped with all six Infinity Stones. It doesn't go that well for him. In fact, pretty much everyone dies. In a last-ditch effort, Captain America, the last man standing, battles Thanos head-on. But with one swift punch, Thanos shatters Cap's shield. And that is how we're able to test the upper limits of Vibranium. Now, you might be asking how we could possibly calculate the energy output of all six Infinity Stones, but the thing is, we don't have to. At the beginning of this battle in the comics, in an effort to impress Mistress Death, Thanos turns off all the other powers except for the Power Stone, even though throughout the battle he's still doing reality-bending tricks, but whatever. So we know that Thanos' punch, infused with the Power Stone, is one of the few forces able to break through the limits of Vibranium. That still leaves us with the challenge of solving its potential energy, but Infinity War gives us exactly the information that we need. During the climactic battle against Thanos on Titan, we see him use the Power Stone to destroy one of the planets its moons, and then rain the shards back down onto Titan's surface. Fragmenting a moon like that is certainly powerful, but notice that it doesn't blow up the moon in one go, but rather it has to dismantle it in one continuous wave across the planet. All of that tells us is that the energy required to blow up a moon is ultimately greater than what the gauntlet can deliver in one punch, because it has to dismantle the moon in parts rather than all at one time. From there, believe it or not, it's actually relatively simple to calculate the energy needed 
needed to blow apart a planet or moon. Basically, all you need to do is have enough energy to overcome the gravitational binding energy that's pulling all that matter into the shape of the moon. I could probably go more in depth into that in a future episode. Anyway, the gravitational binding energy of a uniform sphere is equal to 3 gm squared over 5 r, where g is the gravitational constant, m is the mass of the sphere, and r is its radius. So, I'm just gonna use our moon as a stand-in for the one that Thanos destroys here. You get about 2.07 times 10 to the 29th joules of energy. That is 1 billion times what Saitama had to deliver in order to destroy that asteroid. And that's honestly where the battle sits right now. Do I think One Punch Man should win this matchup? Yeah, absolutely. The fact that we haven't seen Saitama break a sweat doing any of these extreme feats tells me that he could punch a moon and very easily destroy it in one punch. However, based purely on the feats of strength that we've seen in both franchises, Vibranium has shown itself able to handle kinetic energy input far beyond what we've seen Saitama a deliver. So, is that it? Vibranium wins, at least until One Punch Man Season 2 sometime in 2019? Well, not quite. I have one last twist. Based on the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It has to be released somehow. Vibranium, like we discussed, typically stores and releases the energy in a controlled way. It's one of Black Panther's most useful skills. However, as we saw when Mjolnir hit Captain America's shield, Vibranium can indeed withstand all that energy, but it can't quite absorb absorb all that energy, resulting in a shockwave that flattened the forest a hundred feet in either direction. So imagine what happens if Saitama punches the vibranium shield with the same force he used on that meteor, or a force equal to Thanos destroying the moon. The vibranium would be unable to store all of that energy, releasing an even greater shockwave. On the low end, Saitama's punch is almost 474 times more powerful than Mjolnir's hit. The damage would be unspeakable. Every Everything and anyone within nine miles of that impact would be totally decimated. Thus, in a battle between Saitama and Vibranium, the ultimate loser would be us. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And hey, if you enjoyed this episode and haven't seen One Punch Man, well, check it out. It's available on Netflix and Verve right now. And while you're checking out stuff on the internet, check out my friends over on Wisecrack. They helped us by collaborating on the research for this episode, and they're just awesome guys. They have their main channel, Wisecrack, which if you've watched this channel for a while, you've heard me mention before. But they also have a dedicated new channel to film analysis called Earthling Cinema. I watch a lot of film analysis videos, and these are always way more fun than your average directorial review or hoity-toity film school breakdowns. Those have their place, certainly, and I totally binge-watch those, but Earthling Cinema analyzes movies from the perspective of an alien who shows up after humans have gone extinct. No joke, it's a very outsider's perspective on what makes movies great, and they just posted a new episode about Spider-Man Homecoming, which was pretty awesome as a movie. The episode talks about everything from how Spider-Man Homecoming relates to the tropes of classic 80s movies, all the way to its parallels with Birdman, all through the perspective of an alien with incredible eyebrows. You should definitely give this new channel a shot by clicking the box on the right or the link in the description, and leaving a comment letting them know that the theorists were here. Uh, something that'll stand out, something that reflects the fact that, you know what, I'm just gosh darn hungry as I write this episode, turkey. Go to their channel and comment turkey. Why are they commenting turkey? And we'll all know the secret and we'll just laugh to ourselves at our little in insider joke. So that's it. One punch the link you see on screen and comment on the video, turkey. It'll be our confusing little secret. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to go make myself a sandwich and catch up on another anime that's currently running. Hmm, what could it be?